Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, I am super excited for the talk today. Uh, we have two wonderful guests. R. Michael Hendricks is a musician, graphic designer, professor, and entrepreneur. He is a partner and the global design director for IDEO. He teaches entrepreneurship at Berkeley College of Music and has delivered keynotes at Fast Company, Wired, South by Southwest, American Institute of Graphic Art, and many others. He also served as an advisor to the White House's Global Entrepreneur Initiative in 2015. Panos Panay is a musician, entrepreneur, and senior vice president for global strategy and innovation at Berkeley College of Music and a fellow at MIT Connection Science. He is also the founding managing director of Berkeley Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship. Uh, Panos founded Sonic Bids, which introduced electronic press kits to connect musicians and promoters. And Panos has been named to Fast Company's Fast 50 list and Inc. Magazine's Inc. 500, among other honors. Panos and Michael are the authors of Two Beats Ahead, What Musical Minds Teach Us About Innovation. Joining me for a discussion about the book and what they learned in the process, please help me give a very warm welcome to R. Michael Hendricks and Panos Panay. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for coming. And we have Panos there too. All right. Uh, thank you both so much for coming. And just to get it right out, in case someone only sees a few seconds, go buy this book. We're starting with that. Yes, thank you. Two beats of course. ahead. Of course, two beats ahead. I absolutely loved it. Toward the end of the book, you talked about how the two of you met. Um, and what I found hilarious is the fact that you almost didn't meet because you don't like morning meetings, Panos, uh, which I can relate to. But for the audience, I thought it might help uh, for the two of you to kind of explain how, how you met serendipitously. Well, for the record, I don't like morning meetings, but I'm a morning person. I just don't like to talk to people first thing in the morning. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, we were both invited to go to this conference in Boston that was all about innovation and creativity. And it was one of those dreary, cold Boston snowy mornings. So the last thing you really want to be doing is trekking across town to go to a yet another innovation conference. Uh, so. I went there, I, I, I guess I first realized, okay, the crowd is kind of interesting. And I, I was on a panel about uh, entrepreneurship and specifically uh, actually about how creative institutions in Boston were teaching entrepreneurship, uh, like Emerson, me at Berkeley, um, uh, the School and Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and then when I finished the panel, I went backstage and Michael was there and we started having a conversation. He says, oh, I'm from IDEO. And I was uh, a bit of an IDEO groupie. And I thought he looked like Matt Bellamy from News. So I'm like, oh, this guy's pretty cool. And then we just had an intuitive connection. Uh, but as we say in the book, I almost, like I literally almost bailed out last minute because I looked at whether I'm like, I'm not going to this thing. <laughs> I mean, for the readers, I'm happy that you did. Um, but yeah, I read that and I was like, oh, he's my spirit animal. Um, <laughs> another thing that the two of you mentioned in the book that I found really interesting is uh, even though you came from different backgrounds, uh, in terms of just the, the way that you moved about your careers, you mentioned specifically toward the beginning of the book that neither of you navigated your careers in what would be considered uh, traditional for business people. Can you talk a little bit about how each of you kind of navigated uh, your way to where you are today? Yeah, um, I mean, my my background is graphic design. That's what I went to college for. My first job was in advertising. Um, and as I uh, started to get um, more knowledge in that space, I started to think about branding, et cetera. But that quickly led me into an entrepreneurial world because I was thinking about how, you know, as a graphic designer, it went from how a corporate identity would would create consistent experiences for people with an organization to how a brand would create consistent experiences. And at some point I was like, well, if all experiences create a brand, all of it needs to be designed. And that led me into the entrepreneurial space of like, okay, I need to work with these other people and I I should help design the the legal contracts that we use, the uh, <laughs> the software that we're using, the uh, marketing strategy, et cetera. And, um, that it was that leap that got me thinking more in a enterprise way about what businesses are and how a creative person could work in an enterprise space. So by uh, moving into that space, then I eventually found my way to IDEO because I found out 
I really liked building the business. I did not like maintaining the business. And <laughs> going to a place like IDEA was great because I could help other companies build new businesses, but then I wouldn't have to run them and optimize them and things like that. Very interesting. And Panos, I know you had an interesting background. Can you kind of walk through how you started to how you got to where you are today? Yeah, I, I'm originally from Cyprus, which is where I'm at right now, working, I guess, quote unquote, remotely from Boston. So I don't, I don't, know, I don't know if we're ever going to be refer, referring to this as remote anymore because it's, it's work. <laughs> um, but I went to Berkeley to originally study guitar, ended up studying music business. Um, became a talent agent uh, right after college, spent about seven years learning the ropes, booking some really amazing world-renowned artists like Nina Simone and Leonard Cohen. And if uh, the audience knows jazz, uh, people like uh, the pianist Chick Corea, uh, Pat Metheny, the guitar player. Uh, and then after that, I started a company called Sonic Bids. Um, that was the first platform uh, that enabled bands to connect with music promoters. Um, and this was in 2000, it was a novel idea. It, it grew to become um, the de facto standard for connecting bands and promoters, big events like South by Southwest and uh, festivals around the world use it exclusively to book artists. Over a million shows or gigs happened through the site uh, over the 13 years or so that I ran the business, sold it in 2013. Uh, to a private equity group that merged it with the Billboard Media Group and uh, then went to Berkeley to found the Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship and then eventually took several roles to my current role of senior vice president in charge of uh, our institutional strategy and our global footprint. So I oversee uh, three of our um, non-Boston campuses, including New York City, Abu Dhabi, and Spain. And I'm also responsible for our expansions to China and hopefully soon in Los Angeles. Um, so I have a fun job and I'm like, a, I like to say, say that I'm uh, either like a kid in a candy shop or a kid guitar player in a guitar shop. I've been both of those. Um, so I can relate. And it definitely sounds like you're not really busy. It sounds like you have like a lot of free time. You don't do very much. So I, I get that. Yeah, in my spare time, I write books. Oh, obviously, <laughs> obviously. Um, I want to skip around a little bit because you you just mentioned Sonic Bids and Sonic Bids is something I want to jump into. I'm a little biased because to be 100% honest, my band used Sonic Bids, so I'm very familiar with, uh, with it. Mm -hmm. But um, that is, I mean, this is a book about innovation. Sonic Bids was incredibly innovative. I would love to hear a little bit about kind of what you learned. And I know this is a weighted question because there was a long time you were with Sonic Bids but what you learned about innovation from not only the, the launch and, and building it, but also from the point of selling it and moving from it? Well, first it's accidental. Um, I, I, to be very open with you, I, you don't s sort of start by saying, I'm going to be innovative. <laughs> and and I, you know, like I, I think y y you just, similar to, I guess, writing a song, you just have something in your head and you're trying to express it. And it's, it's an iterative process. You kind of stumble on it more so than manufacture it. And I think with Sonic Bids, many of the things that I, in hindsight, I'm looking back at it and I'm saying, oh, wow, we pioneered this stuff. I wasn't thinking about it as I'm pioneering anything. I was just thinking, I'm just trying to find a solution to this thing. Um, so we created the first online electronic press kit didn't exist before. That's people now refer to it all the time as EPK. Um, only in hindsight did I realize, wow, we were the first entity to, to do that. Uh, I was just motivated by how do I create a standard way for displaying band information online so you can go through hundreds or thousands of these in minutes rather than days, which is what it would take if you got it through the mail with a compact disc, right? Um, the other thing is that it's 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 a process and it's um, it, it's that it doesn't end. It's not like you're saying, "Oh, I innovated." There's a <laughs> pancake. I'm done, right? I mean, uh, I'll, I'll just make another pancake because uh, I have the batter. It, it doesn't really work that way. I, I mean, it's it's an ongoing process that doesn't quite 
and it's it's much more organic than it is let's say plastic right you don't just create it and put it there and ta-da, you have it for forever um and then i would say that it's um you just have to accept that more often than not it's a frustrating process meaning that you probably spent 90 percent of your time frustrated and 10 percent of your time satisfied <laughs> rather than maybe what people think that it's oh no you're 90 percent of the time you're satisfied because you've innovated and then 10 percent of the time you're just trying to birth your next innovation it's kind of the other way around um and and you know kind of like um kind of like oregano uh just enough is good enough and too much just sucks um so <laughs> you, you can't just keep innovating because then you're just in my view, you're, you're, you're confused. If you just keep spewing out products, new products, novel products, you don't really know what's working or what's not working. You're just throwing stuff out there. But if you are intentional about it, not so much about being prescriptive about what you're creating, but in saying, look, I'm going to try four or five things that are solving these particular sort of challenges and see how it works then it's always better rather than just trying to do everything. That's my philosophy. I'm sure that if you read any number of quote unquote innovation books, they'll tell you something totally different. Or if you talk to a Jeff Bezos that's running a multi-billion dollar, or trillion dollar uh, company, maybe they have the ability to do a whole lot more. That was all my experience. Well, I do. I have a conversation with Jeff next week, so I'm going to ask him about that uh, and about all the oregano that he uses and kind of see where he nets out. Um, but I think on, on the subject of, of innovation and specifically in the technology space, um, in the book, you talk about uh, Imogen Heap's blockchain project. Um, I know, Panos, I believe that you also were involved with the blockchain project with the Open Music Initiative at Berkeley. I guess my question in terms of those elements and in innovation is when we look at musicians, when we look at educators, I guess, because both of those have elements of kind of education and we look at different aspects of the music business. When it comes to innovation, do you feel as though a lot of the people in order to get involved into the music business, not just music, but the music business are now required to have a deeper understanding of technology in order to promote, distribute, market, potentially even make, if you're an image in heap, uh, music in the current industry? Undoubtedly. And Open Music is something that Michael and I, uh, as a matter of fact, co-founded. That was another one of our joint projects. Um, so many. And, and um, yeah, we're like Lennon McCartney or whatever. Uh, <laughs> only, 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 only we're not as good because we don't fight. Like if you fight with each other, then you're getting better, right? <laughs> um, but look, I, I would argue that there's never been such a thing as music making without technology. and um, the first person that found a human bone fragment decided to drill a couple of holes in it and make a flute. Arguably, that was a technological invention, right? Um, and a, a, a piano or a guitar is an amazing piece of technology. I mean, if you step back and you think about the piano as we know it today, which is a several hundred, several hundred years old instrument, it's an amazing, uh, amazingly complex piece of machinery. Um, it's an ingenious piece of machinery, right? Um, so I would say that musicians and technology have always innovated together hand in hand. Uh, and maybe I'm jumping a bit here, but I would say I'm not afraid of AI ever replacing musicians any more than I'm afraid of word processors ever replacing uh, Stephen King. Um, they combined, the two are unbeatable. Uh, but I do believe that if you're a musician today, you have to be trilingual. You have to be obviously creative and great in your craft. You have to understand technology, and then you have to understand business. Um, and the weight, if you will, can be distributed differently. But that's what we're developing at Berkeley, trilingual um, uh, creators who are comfortable with technology as much as they're comfortable with their own their own instruments. Because if you think about it, number one, most, mo most instruments are technology and many new instruments are all technology. Uh, but also today, um, all music is bits and bytes and all distribution platforms are primarily, they're not trucks, they're not shelves, 
um, their uh, wires and protocols and platforms that are all in the digital realm. So the better you understand it, the better. I'm not actually asking you to be a, uh, you know, you don't need to know Python necessarily, though you'd be better off if you did. Uh, but you should at least have some intuitive understanding of what technology enables you as a creative human being to do, both in the creation of your creative expression, but also in the connection with your audience um, of your creative expression. Mm. Yeah, I think that one band that you uh, you both highlighted that I thought was really doing interesting things in terms of technology was Wilco. Um, and for those, by the way, that haven't read this book yet, as you read it, you're going to see, I mean, there are cool bands after cool bands after cool bands that just pop up throughout this book. But Michael, I wanted to ask you, you know, when you talk to John from Wilco, uh, one of the things I really liked was the pattern of handing off an idea from one member of the creative team to another uh, in the process of development. I, I have a later question where we could talk about the complex nature of lemonade, which which is a much deeper topic. But I was curious, uh, Michael, with you, when you think about that pattern of handing things off from one to the other, how how does that exist at IDEO, and how have you used that specifically in your work there? Well, I, I think most good ideas are developed in that way. You know, it's that an individual have. Um, an inkling of, or an intuition for what something should be. And they can take it so far. Um, if they're smart, they'll share it early. And I think at IDEA, that's one thing we, we encourage with our teams is, you know, it's fine to go heads down for a while to try to figure something out, but don't, don't, try, don't go heads down to try to perfect something. What's better is to go heads down until you, you feel like um, you have something uh, that has, um, a clear intention or is whose intents is clear enough that you can put it in front of somebody else and they can look at it and go, huh, that's an interesting thing. Let me, let me add to this or let me subtract this, et cetera. So, you know, uh, John talks about that and we'll go, he's like, basically Jeff will, Jeff will come up with some ideas for songs and they're, they can be pretty well developed as far as melody or, or structure, but he hasn't figured out the arrangements. He hasn't figured out um, whether it's, you know, going to be a, a bossa nova, or some kraut rock tune, the same, the same melody and the same, you know. So that's where the band comes in. That's where those the expertise of each member comes in and they can add to that, they can shape it. And over time you get something new. And the, the design process works exactly the same where any one of us might have an idea uh, to build upon with the expectation that others will build upon it, that it's not the singular responsibility of any individual to have the right idea. Um, in fact, it seems ludicrous to even say that somebody would um, at this point. The complexity of everything is so significant that if you don't have multiple people on it, you probably have many blind spots um, that are going to pop up further down the road. Wow. You sound like someone I want to work with, just generally speaking. It sounds very <laughs> friendly and welcoming. Um, and I guess just a, a, a quick follow-up to that. was: Were there moments when the two of you were writing this book where one of you might have said, hey, I have like a rough idea for what I want a chapter to be about uh, or, or, or I, what I want a thread to be and you kind of just bounced it back and forth? All the time. As a matter of fact, I think the whole book was that. <laughs> I think the whole book was, gee, I have a rough idea. I'm not really sure what I'm saying here, but can we kind of figure it out? As a matter of fact, I think it was key for us to even getting to writing a book because um, it, the book started as a, a bit of a, um, an outgrowth of a course that, um, I originally started and then Michael took over and put his own imprint and stamp at Berkeley. And the course was based on my own experience as, uh, an entrepreneur, which is that for years I was sort of like ran away from my background as a musician only to realize when I went to Berkeley that in fact it was in it was so interconnected to my entrepreneurial process um, but many of those chapters just started as oh what if we you know we wanted to stay write something about listening we probably had the mindsets more or less there but exactly how the chapter was going to flow or who we would even talk to uh, was an iterative process. As a matter of fact, when we talk to the people that we have in the book, whether it's a Justin Timberlake or a 
T-Bone Burnett or Jimmy Iovine uh, or an Imogen Heap. Uh, we didn't, or Steve I, we didn't start the interviews by saying, we're going to talk to you about um, connecting or uh, reinventing or re remixing. Um, we just had an, a discussion with them, a, a chat, a, a, a conversation over a cup of coffee or a meal uh back when we actually used to be able to do that stuff um and and we just then went back and put them in different chapters i i love that i absolutely love that and you know you feel that a little bit it felt almost like watching a documentary as you're kind of navigating the book which is kind of you know your interviews dictate how the story goes um michael i had a uh, another question for you uh, this one related, there were a lot of things in this book, believe it or not, as I was reading, I was expecting a little more of an educational experience. And then I started getting things that were speaking to my spirit. I'm like, this is too close. This is too much. Um, one of those things was your credo, which is don't get ready, get started. Uh, I would, that, that hit me like a ton of bricks. Uh, and it's something that I almost want to just write and put on my wall. How did that come to be your approach and, and kind of your credo as you moved forward? Well, it definitely comes out of, you know, IDEO uh, has roots in, in the Bay Area. And um, so that a lot a lot of the ideas in the book that um, are showing up like that one come out of the entrepreneurial history of innovation and creativity in the Bay. And so, um, you know, that's a hacker culture. That's an engineering culture. That's like, I don't know how this thing works. Let's just like start putting stuff together and see what happens. And um, in the book, the way we we really make that clear is we talk about demoing, and it it actually relates back to your previous question around um, how do you how do you create a create the conditions for a situation where people are collaborating together, um, and it comes down to this simple idea of exploring intent. So, um, if you're curious about something, you want to manifest that curiosity through some kind of exploration. It's not about trying to understand the whole situation at first. It's just about trying to get something out there initially that other people can respond to and build upon. Um, it takes a lot of pressure off of you as an individual because you don't have to have it all figured out. You don't even have to understand the whole problem. All you have to do is be able to express one idea clearly and then other people can can riff on it with you. Um, that's what a song demo is, right? Like if, um, I don't know if you, there, you know, each, at the end of each chapter, we have playlists. At the end of the demo chapter, we have all of these naked demos, basically, where you have like, you know, um, it could be like Michael Jackson just singing into the mic without any accompaniment at all. At all or, um, but it, if you listen to those demos, what you hear is someone that doesn't have everything figured out, but they have a clear idea of what they want to communicate to the world. And then other people can come along, the producer, the other band members, and contribute to that. And that's what we're talking about when this like um, this idea of just getting started. It's it's just leaning into that concept of sharing early. Don't let perfection be the enemy of good is another statement you probably have heard, you know, in the ether. Uh, it means the same thing. Well, I love that. Um, it really spoke to me, so thank you. Um, and I'm going to get to more questions in a second. I just wanted to remind the folks that are watching, please feel free to drop questions in because we're going to have some Q&A. Um, toward the end. So if you have burning questions, trust me, I could talk to these two probably for another few hours. So if you don't, it's totally fine. But if you do, feel free to drop those in. Um, in the meantime, one one last question for you, Michael. I know I'm kind of, I'm, I'm hammering away at you, but I there are so many sections that I found really interesting about kind of your process. And one of the things that you had mentioned in, or both of you mentioned in, in Michael, in your specific process, was that you experienced a lot of challenges when you first became a leader in kind of understanding what type of leader you want to be. I would love to understand kind of how those challenges work for you, how they manifested. And then Panos, I'm gonna to come to you next. So I'm just warning you. I would love to understand a little bit from your experience when Sonic Bids grew, how you start, sort of embraced leadership as well. Yeah, so we, there's um, a chapter of the book about producing. And this is really the chapter in the book where we talk about leadership. Interestingly, it was the last chapter we wrote in the book. I think it's like chapter five, maybe in the book, but it's the last one we actually wrote because um, to get, get into the process behind the scenes, Pontus and I turned in the manuscript to the book and the editor was like, great, but you lack like whatever, 12,000 words or something like that. We're like, oh, really? <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, uh, 
So uh, we went back and wrote the producing chapter, which turned out to be, uh, I, I think both of, for both of us, our favorites, because we talked to Hank Shockley, we talked to T-Bone Burnett, we talked to Jimmy Ivey. And um, what, you know, what, what each of them is saying in the book is that it's not about ma like directly managing the people that you're with. It's about creating conditions for success around them. Um, and they will each say that in a different way and each, each has their own poetry, so to speak. But for me as a leader, I, it took me a long time to figure that out myself too. You know, as I, I had creative directors early in my career that essentially made me their hands. You know, they had the vision, they had the idea, like you, lowly art director, <laughs> do what I say. <laughs> and, you know, and if you didn't do what they said, you would get fired. I mean, I had a lot of, I had, I worked at my first company. I think I, I was uh, one of the early uh, art director hires in the course of three and a half years, I had seven other people hired alongside me and fired because they didn't do what the art director said. So wow. when I when I started to like first started my own business and then had my own company, I picked up some of those habits of being directive toward people. But you know what I learned over time is that I wasn't um, acknowledging their talent um, or their potential. I I um. Basically, I was, I was being arrogant about how great I thought my ideas were. <laughs> um, you know, I was using I was using the power of my role to control the output, and all of those things are actually huge mistakes as a leader. So, to take it back to the the producers in the book, you know, what what the parallel to being a good creative director in a place like IDEO is you can't you don't control anybody, but what you try to do is create the conditions around them for them to. Um, uh, be their creative best, you know, where they, where they mm. feel most comfortable, they feel challenged in the right way. Like you're, you're as a more of a coach or a mentor, you're helping them see themselves in new light. You're helping them stretch into new goals. That's what a music producer is doing with any of these artists. They're not telling the artists what kind of songs to make or, you know, <laughs> what they're doing is they're saying, okay, here's your idea. I'm going to help bring the best of that idea out. Um, so it took me a long time to do that. I mean, there's a story in the book of me screwing that up at IDEO. Um, I won't share it here. You can go read the book, but <laughs> but I screwed it up, you know. And I and um, thankfully I had colleagues that would, were willing to come to me and say, "Hey, Michael, that wasn't right. You shouldn't do it that way." And I learned over time uh, to unlearn those early habits I had as a leader. Yeah, and I would encourage folks to read that because you know, as as much as we're laughing about it, it was something I think that everyone can relate to. I know personally when I read it, I was like, "Oh, I've done that." <laughs> um, and and Panos, for you, you know, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I would imagine that you had to you had a little bit of baptism by fire as Sonic Bids grew, where there was kind of a almost a demand on you to be like, "Well, I know how to be a leader. I I planned for this to be huge." Uh, how did you kind of learn on the job as Sonic Bids was growing how to be the leader maybe that that company needed and continue to change as that company maybe needed different styles of leadership? It was extremely challenging, to be honest. Um, I think that it was easier for me when the company was small to play that role um, because part of my leadership style at the time was dependent on M me motivating people because I knew people, right? Because I knew who they were. And it's very different motivating a small team where you know every individual and they know you to leading a bigger team and certainly leading a bigger organization where your means of communication are both different and, 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 um, they are just not as personal, right? Um, and and I had struggled. The truth is that I struggled as the company was growing to maintain not just leadership but evolving my management style. And um, I will say that probably I didn't truly improve in my job until I went to Berkeley where I was not dealing with an organization of a few dozen people. I was dealing with an organization of several thousand people where you know for a fact that you cannot rely on your old instincts in order to be able to be effective. Uh, it, it's sort of the difference between, you know, being in a country where people kind of sort of speak English 
uh, versus being in a country where nobody speaks a word of whatever your native language is. And you just cannot rely on all the tools that you have developed for most of your life. You just have to totally reframe the way that you're approaching communication. Um, so uh, it was an evolutionary process. I think that I struggled, I failed. Many of my mistakes while running the business were around people uh, versus, and I would say to this day, looking back, um, it, you know, you almost accept that you're getting product decisions wrong, but in a funny way, it's a lot easier to correct a product decision than it is to correct a decision about a person. Um, uh, and it's not so much because you're not swift to let somebody go, for example, it's because frankly, it just takes you a long time to recognize that you made a decision. Then it takes you a long time to reconcile with the fact that you made a wrong decision and then <laughs> deciding what the decision ought to be about a human being tends to be very different. Uh, not to mention that the ripple effect of a wrong decision, especially when it comes to people in the upper uh, ranks of the organization, if you get it wrong then the ripple effect is significantly greater. Um, and, 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 and that changes and becomes even great, even bigger as the organization grows in size and say executives now have entire groups of people that are reporting uh, to them. Yeah, that sounds really, it, it reminds me a little bit of when I used to play music and I used to tell people I was far more nervous playing in front of 15 people than I was playing in front of like 1,500. You know, because when you're there, every mistake seems magnified. And just to be clear, I never played for 1,500 people, but you understand what I mean. Um, one thing, uh, another thing that really spoke to me in this book, and you'll notice I'm pulling out really specific things, but there were just, there were so many little pieces that the two of you included um, that, again, really spoke to me and felt like a lot of the experiences I was going through. And one piece that you mentioned in the coda of the book, which, by the way, I, I just want to say for those that read it, I loved the the chapter, the way that you uh, uh, organized the chapters and the fact that the ending was called the coda was, was beautifully mm -hmm. done. Um, but one thing that you very briefly mentioned in the coda was the fact that you both have had imposter syndrome. Uh, for someone like me, who not only read the book, but read a lot about the two of you, I find it equal parts shocking uh, and incredibly surprising, but then also I'm sitting there being like, oh, thank gosh, not just me. Uh, I would love to learn more about how the two of you have navigated your careers and even navigated writing this book and having these conversations with a lot of these people when you also have that imposter syndrome. Yeah, it's, it's such a... Um interesting thing isn't it like despite all of your progress you make in your career or the successes you have you can still feel like you don't belong or you haven't done it the right way or um and i you know um <laughs> i remember a survey once at idea where it seemed like i don't know well well over it seemed like well over three quarters of the company had imposter syndrome so um you know it's, it's interesting because I, I i think it, it's partly um at least in my experience, in, in creative communities, um, they're highly sensitive, and we're all looking to one another for validation, right? We're, and it's like you're—it's um, not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it, because it can be motivating too. You can see something uh, excellent that somebody does, and you can think not jealously. You can—you you, just—you're not jealous about it, but you look at it and go, "Wow, I don't think I'm that good," or "I don't." Don't know if I can do it that well if they did, and that's admiration. Um, and sometimes that can be motivating. You're like, well, I don't want to let them down. That's usually where it comes from in my world. I don't want to be less than them because that lets them down. So I need to rise to the occasion. And but am I? Do I really believe I can get there? Um, but what what I've what I have to keep reminding myself over and over again, um, as a as an executive, as a as a creator, um, is that I don't. I don't need the validation of other people to um, know whether or not I'm doing something good or not. And I think that's where most of that imposter syndrome, syndrome comes from, is that we want other people to tell us, yeah, that you did a good job, you know, or that was excellent. Or the truth is, and, I, and you know, we were talking about innovation earlier. I think most of the time in, in the innovation space, and I, um, and, it, and I think any good leader is always trying to do something new. You're gonna do things that 
are so new that you're not going to get any good validation from it because it's <laughs> it's change, it's different, it causes friction, it's hard, there's no precedent. And if you're looking to other people to tell you that you've done a good job, you're going to feel really bad most of the time because you're not going to get that. It's only after time passes whether people know whether or not you had success in that decision or you know that you had success. So therefore, you're what you really have to do is dig deep into the, what you believe to be the right decision for that moment, have conviction about it and stick with it. You know, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're uncaring about the criticism or um, you, you don't seek feedback, but it's important to understand the context you're in. You know, new things are hard. Innovation is hard. Leadership is hard. And so you're not going to get that feedback that makes you feel good. I love that. Panos, do you have any feelings on, on imposter syndrome and experiencing that in your progress? The truth is, if you don't feel you're an imposter, you're a sociopath. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, 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 because by nature, what we're doing, things are always changing. And, you know, you, you do go through periods where you're like, gee, do I really know what I'm doing? And the truth is, most of the time, you kind of don't really know what you're doing. And I think if you accept that, then you have the humility to learn as you're um, you're going through through situations. Um, so for me, I, I I would be lying if I said that I don't I don't feel like I'm an imposter uh, more often than not. As a matter of fact, my view is that the key to learning is to put yourself in situations where you kind of have to. Uh, almost pretend you know more than you do up until your knowledge sort of catches up and then you do it all over again and all over again and that's the key to growth. The minute you feel I belong and this is it and this is now now I know everything and I'm no longer thinking that I know the part but I know the part. Well, my view is the minute you reach that point, it's time to to move. It's time to do something different, expand your uh, your comfort zone. Uh, if you're not feeling like an imposter, then maybe you're just playing too much into your comfort zone. I feel like I'm getting music, you know, like when, when a, when a well-established artist puts out something new and they're like, I don't know if people are going to like it. I don't know how they feel, you know, that says nothing about their mastery as musicians. They're great. They're, you know, they're, they're excellent in their craft. They're great in their game, but because they are moving into those new spaces where there is no precedent that they're not going to, they, they're not going to get the the immediate validation, you know, and lots of times they'll even get criticism until other people come along and go, Oh, that was a genius. You know? <laughs> well, I feel like that, I mean, that applies to, um, I mean, you mentioned a few different bands that did this. I mean, you, you talked about, uh, uh, radio uh, having done, having gone through this process, you actually included for those that don't know, by the way, um, at the end of every chapter, they, uh, it's almost like a little mixtape in the book, which is really cool because the mixtape applies to the chapter uh, and a lot of the, the elements of the chapter that you had just read. And I found it interesting that you had included um, Justin Timberlake's Filthy in that playlist because that was also a very clear departure from a lot of what he'd done before that. Um, but speaking of Justin, and I swear I didn't plan this segue, but it works, so I'm gonna use it. Uh, I found it really interesting that multiple people going you know, to, to what the two of you just said, multiple people like Justin Timberlake, like Imogen Heap, and many others in the book talked about doing what scares them, right? Which I think plays a lot into imposter syndrome and playing in your comfort zone for what the two of you were just talking about. When you were approaching this book specifically, and I don't know if this is too candid of a question, did this process scare you? And how did you kind of navigate that experience and choose to move forward? The, the book writing process? Just, uh, yeah, writing, writing, coming out and writing. Uh, uh, this is not an easy book to have written. I'm just going to say that from my vantage point. So taking on this challenge seems daunting. It, it was, at times it felt daunting and almost impossible. Um, I think both of us at different times basically said, I'm just going to quit. I can't do this. Um, and we had a point where maybe both of us we're ready to quit. As a matter of fact, we were late, very late in giving our manuscript. We had to ask for an extension. We were like two school ch children uh, that we had to keep finding excuses about why our homework was being turned in late. Uh, <laughs> um, but, 
You know, Josh, it was just the act and art of incrementalism. I mean, at the end of the day, you just say, every day I'm going to make a bit of progress. I'm going to make a, make a bit of progress. And I certainly experience times where I'm like, I, I have no brain space to even think about this book. And it, especially if you're going through a time of like, a book is a generative process, right? And you have to be in a particular space of mind. And if you're doing a job like uh, that, like ours or the one that, you know, up until coronavirus I was doing where I was always on planes, always in hotels, always traveling. I, I, I would do several hundred thousand miles a year being away from home most of the year. It was just hard to find yourself in that space to, to be generative. But again, part of what's great about it is that if I was writing this book on my own, I think would be, I think I would have never gotten it done. But when it's two people, then you kind of rely on each other when one is, not to be so cliche, one is faltering, the other one keeps going and the other way around. And we both brought very different things to the book at the end of the day. And I think that's why it's it, Two Beats Ahead is a, is a I'm, I, I think I'm objective. When we, you know, you write this book and we wrote it more than a year ago and you kind of forget what you wrote. I mean, so when you get the book and it's the finished product, you're like, I, I better read my own book. <laughs> Um, and, and, and I, 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 because, you know, when it's, when it's a manuscript and it's all of these pages and chapters, it, it, you don't have the linearity of reading the book and digesting it as an objective reader. You're just thinking about it as a writer. So when we, when we got the book, I remember just putting it next to my bed stand and just reading it I'm like, you know what? It, it's a pretty darn good book. I, I, I said to Michael, <laughs> I, I, I always wanted to write a book that. It's the kind of book that when I go up at bed at night, no matter how tired I am, I sit next to my bed stand and I can't wait to open it and read even four pages and pass out. That that Then I know it's a book that I want to read versus the dozens of books that I buy that are just sitting there and you're like, oh God, it's like, you know, it's like, it's funny. I like eating spinach, so it's not the best analogy, but it's like eating, you know, bitter vegetables for those who don't like vegetables, which for the record, I I, I do. <laughs> we were going to ask the people want to know how you feel about vegetables. So I'm glad, I'm glad you cleared that up. Um, that's really interesting. And I want to, um, I wanted to, it's so funny because one of the questions I was curious about, we, we got in a similar question in the Q and a about, uh, creative versus non-creative brains. Um, you know, one of the things you said in the book about this, uh, and I, and I want to, I want to touch on this guy. I found this really interesting is you talked about a false choice that we have between creativity and an analytical mindset in education specifically. And you also talked about how it presents itself in organizations where a lot of times people are being forced to choose between something like coding or science over art and music, um, both in organizations and in education. What would you say the two of you learned throughout the process of, of doing this book and talking with these people that might contribute to a solution, whether it's in an organization or in education, to this problem of this kind of false dichotomous choice? Well, you know, um, it's interesting. I mean, Panos, because he is in the education field, will have a more articulate response to this question. <laughs> but I, But I will say that um, my opinion is that as we do create more tools for the world to use, their effect effectiveness will actually be based on the creativity by which they're used, right? So um, I think in education, um, you know, and I have kids that have just basically finished high school. What I've seen in their education has been very, is very information-based, very fact-based, not very application based, not very creativity based, you know. And um I think that's a disservice. I, I I think our emphasis on information and facts and and what I've seen is literalism and literature too. Like not talking about the content of books, but talking about let's make sure we know who the you know protagonist is and where did they go in chapter one and that kind of literalism I, I think is doing a disservice to our future because we'll continue to have more and more tools at our disposal. And uh the creativity of how we use them will advance us, you know, and the lack of creativity won't. Interesting. Panos, do you have any thoughts on that one? 
I, I think we're doing a disservice to 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 let's say both. I use the word disciplines by creating this dichotomy. I mean, science in any form um, is an enormous uh, expression of human creativity and ingenuity, right? I mean, physics or mathematics or engineering um, are a testaments to humans, human imagination and creativity and our attempts to express and understand the world around us, right? Um, and when anybody says, I'm an accountant, I'm not creative, I always say, well, you know, I hate to take it, break the news to you, but accounting is a language in the way that music is a language. And through that language, you're creating a narrative, which let's face it, it's subjective. It's a subjective narrative. You're using a bunch of numbers that may seem objective and maybe they are objective, but the way that you're choosing to display those numbers is entirely a matter of subjectivity any more than the way that a musician chooses to display those notes is a matter of subjectivity. A note is a note is a note, just like a one and a two and a three are numbers, but the way that you are arranging them and the way that you are putting them in a balance sheet or, um, or, or an income statement, there's a lot of subjective interpretation and there's a storyline and a narrative that you're creating. So you are creative. Um, the other thing for me is that for anybody who's had children or observed children, you know that every single human being is born creative. That's how we learn. That's how we develop all of our cognitive skills and so forth. Uh, it's just that as we develop, as we grow older, both through education systems, um, through, um, you know, other uh, uh, sort of social pressures, and through narratives and scripts that we put in our heads, we say, oh, I'm creative or I'm not creative. I, I think we're all creative, right? It, it's just, it's obscured, um, but you can remove, if you will, those clouds, that gunk that's on top of it and, and underneath everything and everyone is creativity. I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, we got a really great question on partnership. Um, which is the idea that the two of you work so well together. Uh, and kind of the, the, the question is uh, what a key would be to a successful working partnership. Well, you know, in the book we talk about, um, there's a chapter about collaboration. And, and one of the things that we emphasize is that if you look at how musicians collaborate, uh, they're choosing each other based upon their uh, lived experience, their personality, their creativity, and their skill. So it's a kind of respect that you have for your collaborator um, with an expectation that the two of you together will achieve more than you could achieve separately. It's very different than thinking about a collaborator as I was talking earlier about, you know, I'm the head, you're the hands, which I think a lot of people still mistake collaboration for that. You know, it's like, we're gonna work together, but you're gonna do my idea, right? You know? <laughs> um, and I, I think Pontus and I have been very much, we're, we've, we work in this way, like we, we, we've never set out a blueprint for all the things we're gonna accomplish together. <laughs> what we do is we we listen to each other, we respect we, the expertise that each other brings, and then we we actually listen to discover what's possible together. We see something that we think, oh, maybe we could work on that at the same time. We have these different skill sets that we can bring. Um, and I, I would argue, you know, that's the, that's the Beyonce strategy. That's why she says, I wanna be in a band with Jack White, right? She's, she didn't say, I wanna find a session player that plays like, plays hard rock like Jack White. She literally wanted to be in a band with him because she believed in the one plus one equals three mindset. So I, I think that's what we really need to bring to any of these collaborative relationships is a recognition that it starts with respect and admiration and uh, optimism about what might come from those relationships versus some kind of blueprint and directive. I like that. Um... Yeah, I think that's something that we can all learn from in terms of the, the, the partnership. And I think the, the follow-up I have to that is you talk a little bit about how some partnerships that start out really well uh, end up becoming every every person for themselves. Um, I know that, that you mentioned, um, you know, kind of how the Beatles netted out. Uh, to kind of follow up on Lauren's question, how do you avoid coming from a, a place of collaboration and partnership and, and creativity going into an every person for themselves kind of experience? To build on Michael's point, um, I, I obviously openness, honesty, and just accepting that you're 
different. I mean, and, and that's actually, I think really important. Like, uh, I mean, in a funny way, if you go through those playlists, you can pick the songs that are mine and which are Michael's. I, I'm the Duran Duran, Tears for Fears, Depeche Mode guy. And Michael is a, my bloody Valentine Wilco guy. And then we kind of meet halfway through with Radiohead. I mean, um, so um, it's okay. I don't judge Michael's musical taste. <laughs> just yeah, like it sure I'm sounds asking. like you don't. <laughs> uh, just, like, just like I hope he doesn't judge my sunny, uh, you know, British taste. Um, uh, so I, I think accepting that we're different, um, and, but and being just fascinated by that difference. Like it, the truth is, I, I I am genuinely fascinated and curious about Michael's differences to mine, and I learned from him because he's different. Um, and I think it's just important, right? And, and it's true, I think, for a friendship, for a business partnership. And I think it's true for a marriage. You just have to accept that ultimately I'm not going to make my partner in business or marriage or in any other setting. I'm not going to will them to be somebody that they're not. And if I try that and I'm like, the best partnerships for me are when you say, wow, man, Michael is sure doing all the heavy lifting or whatever. And Michael's you know, hopefully Michael's saying, oh man, you know, Palms is doing all the heavy lifting or the stuff that I don't want to be dealing with. That's a good partnership. If you think, man, what? I have no, I have no idea what the hell Michael's doing. Uh, <laughs> and I'm doing all the hard work. That's a bad, that's a bad partnership. Yeah. I think a lot of that comes from having shared purpose, right? Like we, like recognizing that you, your agendas are aligned. You bring different strengths to accomplishing that agenda. When, you know, the, the Beatles example Basically, they lost a shared agenda in the end, you know, and each of them started to pursue their own interests. Um, and of course, there's nothing wrong with that, but it was the end of the Beatles because of that. So um, it's a it's a good test in, in any partnership. It's just uh, do you understand what you're what you're trying to accomplish together? Um, because if you can answer that question easily, then the rest follows. I like that. Um... I keep saying I like that, but I'm really into all your answers. So that's why I say it. Um, I did have a, a little more of a um, a broader question. I, I'm pu pulling out the Zoom because I know we're running out of time. And I, I'm really curious about this. You included a quote uh, by Mohammed al Gurgawi, the, the Minister of Cabinet Affairs of the United Arab Emirates. And what he said was, we live in a tough neighborhood. Radicalism and extremism is on our doorstep. We need to counteract this radicalism with radical new forms of creativity. I want to ask you, and this is a, a tough question, is a heavier question, but given the current polarization of, of the United States, we've seen a lot of extreme events of the past year, um, you know, uh, including but certainly not limited to the pandemic. Um, what forms of creativity or what projects have the two of you seen that have stood out to you as notable uh, in this element of kind of counteracting all of this with radical creativity? For me, without a doubt, is what I observed firsthand uh, in, in the United Arab Emirates and, and in my particular situation in, in Abu Dhabi. Um, Opening up the Berkeley campus in Abu Dhabi was extremely controversial. Uh, among the um, uh, the faculty and staff on campus, it was a massive educational effort to help people understand that um, we were there for all the good reasons that our partners there were reinforcing. And this is a country that have had a macro strategy over forty years to use culture and to use education um, to eradicate those more radical beliefs that you're, you're talking about that they viewed as a, uh, as a threat to their own existence, um, partially motivated by the fact that they've seen and are seeing the, the decline of fossil fuel uh, uh, value if you will, and the need to develop a knowledge economy. But there's something really powerful about going to the Louvre in Abu Dhabi and seeing a Torah and a Bible and a Quran right next to each other in the same room. And if you have any knowledge of the history of that land, knowing that there is a Torah there, 
knowing that there is a a a, uh, a temple being built called the Abrahamic House of Friendship that is a a church, a uh, a mosque, and um, uh, a uh, a Jewish temple, uh, a synagogue, uh, all together. That that takes a lot of courage to do that, and when you are an average person and you walk into that the Louvre in, in, in there and, and, and you see art in the way that it's displayed, you will leave a changed human being. You will leave a changed human, human being. And I've not experienced anything uh, in, in the Western world quite like that. I think we take those things for granted. Uh, and there they've been very intentional about the use of culture and art and education as a means of, of, of progress. Michael, any any thoughts from you on on kind of the radical forms of creativity you've seen that have stood out to you? Well, you know, it, it's <laughs> it's hard to pick pick something that feels significant enough. To be honest, mm. I love I love Panos's response. I mean, the fact that we've been able to roll out vaccinations actually has been to me radically creative. All that coordination, multiple private sector interests, um, all kinds of misinformation. Uh, abounding and yet we're still able to make progress against the situation that we're in is to me a, a highly creative act not fully successful yet of course but um i without creativity there's no way we would have gotten as far as we have so far yeah, all right and, and josh i know we're all out of time but uh, you know I, I i i'd like to say this you know you, you read every day the news and you see what happened in afghanistan uh, with those little girls being being bombed, right? And you know that if you just give people hope, if you help people get opportunity, if you help people feel that they have a different future, which is what culture tells us, what education tells us, then you create empathy, you create humanity. And nothing in my view creates humanity more than culture. Um, not, nothing brings us closer to each other than sharing a piece of music together or dancing to the uh, to a song together, um, and 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 that's what culture at its best does for us. It it it, it reminds us that we're all the same, and um, that's why we need more of it. Well, I think that's the perfect note to end on. Um, thank you both so much for joining us. The book is two beats ahead. Uh, it is absolutely wonderful please go check it out. I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. I'm going to be keeping it and probably referring to it again in the future. Panos, Michael, thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh.